Well, it is, uh, it is Thanksgiving week, and to, I would like to help you to prepare your soul uh, for Thanksgiving week and to have a heart full of Thanksgiving. And for this purpose, uh, and as a part and the conclusion of our series, Psalms for the Heart, we've chosen this beautiful little gem of a psalm, Psalm 100. I remember, and you'll have to forgive me today if I lapse into the King James version of this, because one of my earliest memories was my mother in Grand Rapids as a little boy teaching me to memorize Psalm 100 and Psalm 23 and other psalms, but Psalm 100 specifically. Um, it, and so you're going to hear a mix of that, I'm sure, uh, because Psalm 100 was a blessing to me when I was just a little tiny boy. And maybe it was to you too, or when you were a little tiny uh, girl. Because it's like a charming mountain brook that flows into the mighty ocean of truth. It's shallow enough for a little child to play in its water. And it's so deep that in all your life, you will never find the bottom of it. Psalm 100. It is a universal psalm. It's a psalm for people all over the earth, and that's significant in all generations and all time. You know, it begins, obviously, by saying, make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth, and it ends with faithfulness to all generations. What a beautiful gem of a song. And it's beloved by God's people, and it's useful for things that trouble the human heart. Have you ever had your heart darkened with trouble? Of course you have. As a matter of fact, it's probably true of every, every human heart all the time that we have in our hearts, like things we're looking forward to, that we like, that we're happy about, and things that trouble us, things that bother us, things that darken our souls. And when our souls are darkened or when we're plunged into some gloom, this would be a good place to go in the Bible when something darkens your heart. You know this, if you know me, that Lois and I have a daughter who has a little family and lives on the West Coast in Oregon. And it's a gorgeous place. If you can't live in Michigan, this wouldn't be a bad place to live. But a lot of people I know move from Oregon to Michigan. That should tell you something right there. <laughs> and, uh, but it is very, very beautiful. And uh, and when we go out there, it's humorous because the people are always apologizing for the weather. Leo, I don't know if you noticed this when you guys lived out that way. Oh, I'm sorry about the rain. We were hoping it would be pretty on the coast. And we're like, we came to Oregon. We knew that there would be sunshine, but there would also be beautiful, beautiful, misty conditions and things that make the flowers grow. And that's the way it is with life. You know, that's the reality. Am I right? Maybe in every day we have things that just bless our hearts and make us spontaneously glad and rejoice. But then there are just things that probably all of us carry that are heavy. And I suppose if you're a perceptive Christian and you just look around our, our nation, you know there are just things that would make a good person's heart heavy. And how should a person think? And how should a person talk to herself? How should a person talk to or about God when they have this gloom or when they have this heavy heart? And as beautiful as our world is, as much beauty as we all experience, still there are times of sorrow for us. And yet some of the most beautiful flowers grow in the darkest soil of our life. And God allows things to happen to us, but we have to minister to our spirits with the Word of God. So what should you say to yourself when a dark cloud passes over your soul? Sometimes our hearts are darkened by the presence of evil around us. Um, unlike Jesus, who was joyful and gracious and glad in the very face of evil, and yet he's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. So it's possible, obviously, for us to have sorrow and to lament and also to have the presence of a deep a fountain of joy within us. And some of the language of that is obviously in the Psalms and in this beautiful little gem of a psalm today. When taking a psalm in hand, you want to remember it's a poem, it's a song, and so it has images, it has pictures. It's a good idea sometimes when you're studying a psalm to just go over the psalm quickly and say, what, pic what, is, 
What are the pictures and what are the pictures picturing? What are these images and what do they mean? It's a good thing to do. Uh, I look at Psalm 100 and I immediately see people all over the earth giving praise to God. That's a picture. It's a little heavenly, isn't it? When we read at the end of the Bible, you see that people have gathered from all over the earth and they're giving praise to God. That's what's happening in the psalm. You have people that are serving God, that are giving service to God. You have singing in the presence of God. How beautiful is that? You have a picture that's common in the Bible of a loving shepherd and the sheep that he is caring for or she's caring for. You have gates and courts in a temple. Gates of a temple aren't just regular doors. They're, they're, they're huge doors that allow in multiple people at the same time, and there is the temple. There is something beautiful and poetic about watching people come to worship. I love the way you guys built this church and put that little I got the little office in the corner, that little study in the corner there. And it has windows that look out on the parking lot. And I love to stand in that window and see people coming to worship God. And I realize these are people who love God. These are people who have given of their time to give God honor, thanks, and praise from all kinds of different people. Often those people come with a gift. And they come with the intention of giving attention to God's word. There's something beautiful and sacred about that. Coming to worship is an act of worship. I remember going to Milwaukee with men on a bus during the Promise Keepers movement. I was invited by my brother-in-law to attend the Promise Keepers event in Milwaukee at a stadium. I forget it was a stadium. It was a big arena. And there were 60,000 men. And when I got off the bus and started walking toward this great arena, there was this sense of the presence of God just in this flock, flocking of men just walking together, and their, their intent was to go up to worship. And this is one of the pictures that's given to us in this psalm. And then it's for all people in all places in all times. So again, what do you think and what do you say to yourself and what do you say to others and what do you say God, to God when, for instance, darkness presses in on you, or when, like Fernando Ortega said in a song we sang last week, when dark trials come and your heart is filled with a weight of doubt. When dark trials come and your heart is filled with a weight of doubt. Psalm 100 helps us here. It helps us. There's a structure in the psalm that's interesting. If you study it, of course, it's only five verses, and I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, even can couldn't go to noon with only five verses. <laughs> That's what you were thinking, wasn't it? No, most of you were thinking, I don't know how he'll do it, but he will. That's not what you're really thinking. I mean, um, and yet there is, a, there is a structure here that's really beautiful, like all Psalms are, are stru have a structure to them, a different structure. The structure here is kind of what, why, what, why. The what is what, he, what the psalmist is exhorting us to do giving praise and thanksgiving to God and worship and such. And the why is why should we do that? And it's like verses one and two are the what's. And verse three is a section of why. And verse four is what. And verse five is why. And so we'll, we'll do that as I'll break it down for you. Homiletically, seven things to do when your heart is heavy and seven reasons to do them. These are just the what and the why of those passages broken down. Let's look at the seven things that you should do when your heart is heavy or things that you can do when your heart is heavy. Before I tell you, I want you, you to know this is personal. This is personal. This isn't a message I've ever preached before. This isn't a message I wrote before. This wasn't written for somebody else. I wrote this because we love you. We, uh, the leaders, the elders, the deacons, the men and women that are deacons, the elders of our church, the, the pastoral staff and ministry staff of the church, we care about you. We love you. We, we don't do what we do for money. We appreciate that. Those of us that are paid. We do it because we sincerely want to bring honor to God and because we love you. So this message was for you for today, for this week, because it's Thanksgiving, and I want to help prepare your heart so that you can give thanks to God, so that he will be blessed and pleased by your thanksgiving, so that your kids will see the thanksgiving in your soul. 
And, uh, and so that you maybe, if your heart is a bit heavy or you have things that are hard, then you will be lifted up to God. I was in Meyer yesterday. I should go more often. It's like quick pastoral calling. When you go, to, you see a bunch of people, you know, that you should see. And I saw a lady who can't come here, but loves to come here. And she can't come here. And as soon as I saw her, I followed her back into the store. I hadn't seen her for a long time. And I just looked at her. I said to her, hey, good to see you. I miss you. She said, I miss you. I miss Bethel. Her heart is heavy with a great sorrow. That's hard to express. And so I said to her, I hope you can watch us online and you can see my message tomorrow. So again, I want you to know this is personal. I also know what it's like. I'm a sanguine person. You probably figured that out personally. This isn't about me, but I'm talking. So you know, I'm, a happy, I, I'm a happy person. Every once in a while, Lois will remind me that I self-identify as a happy person. She will say to me, you are a happy person, Ken. Like, kind of like, you are not acting happy right now. So, but for the most part, I, I self-identify as a happy, I'm a happy person. I, I am a very happy person, but I also know the weight of sorrow. And, and I know uh, sorrows that I didn't think I would ever have to bear. And so that's why we talk about the seven things. First of all, and, and by the way, and just be a little caveat, an additional caveat before I begin. I know you're dying to hear those seven things, but an additional caveat before I begin is this. We, we don't expect you to go zero to 60 in gladness to God when your heart is heavy. In a, in a minute. You, that's not how it works. God knows there are psalms of lament. There are times that things are just very painful and very heavy and very difficult. And yet there are ways that you can instruct your soul to, to bring joy over time. So we just don't expect you to pretend you're glad all the time when you're not. But here they are. Number one, make a joyful noise. And this is universal. It's like to all the earth. This is the one true Yahweh God that we're talking about is the God, the creator God, is the God over all the earth. There's not a God for different, different God for different people of the earth. There's one God over all the earth. And, and the psalmist says, make a, a, a joyful noise. And we do tend to make noise. He's saying, make noise, a joyful noise. Second thing then that you do when your heart is heavy is you serve him with gladness. The elders gathered, the deacons gathered this week, last week, uh, men and women in a room, about 20 people or so, and have a really wonderful meeting. Conducting the affairs of the church, the different teams give a report, and we talk over what we need to talk over. And the room is characterized by humor and uh, I think one sister called it collegiality, friendliness, kindness. Um, there's the people in that room, you can tell they like each other. You can tell they love each other. There's, jo there's careful humor, you know, in a bit of banter in the room. Jordan, uh, our, our new youth and family associate pastor, was there for the first time, and he saw it. He picked up on it. He was a part of that, and he, and he picked up on that. That's a warm, joyful meeting. And then when the elders meet, um, uh, they usually have a prayer meeting every Saturday. They have one every Saturday morning, but we had a regular meeting yesterday. There was a spirit in the room of joyfulness. There was, there was humor. There wasn't as much humor, Leo, because you were in you were in Columbus, and so we, it, was, it wasn't as punny as it normally would be in the meeting, but, and we missed that, but, and David, you too, and others, but, but, but we had a happy meeting. As a matter of fact, um, Neil Veit, who's chair of the meeting, actually called it jollity, which is a word we don't always use, jollity. It's not a word you would normally think, hey, fellows, let's get up at seven, and we'll meet. It will be a jolly time. But it was. It was a joyful time, including picking on him for using that word, jollity. Uh, this is serve the Lord with gladness, though. This is the command that we have. I know what you're thinking. You think I'm burning time. No, I'm not burning time. I'm teaching the Bible here. Look, the Bible says, hey, if you have a heavy heart, here's what you do. You worship the one true God with a loud voice. So make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Everybody on earth. And then you serve the Lord with gladness, with humor, with mirth, with joy. There should be times of joy in that. And then, this is so wonderful, you sing. Old Testament and new, there's this importance of singing unto the Lord, a joyful noise. 
and then um, 575 references to singing in the Bible. The Christian faith is the singing faith. 150 songs are embedded in the Bible. Right in the middle of your Bible is a hymn book of 150 songs from God. So seven things to do when your heart is heavy. Make a joyful noise to the Lord while you're thinking about people all over the earth doing that. And then secondly, serve him with gladness. And third, sing. And four, Andrew Scorch, go to church. Go into his presence. I've mentioned him before because I've read many of his works, but an, an, a, a, a well-known uh, president of, of Wheaton, they call it Wheaton College, and uh, I guess it's still called that, Wheaton College, is, was V. Raymond Edmund. And he had a unique uh, illustration in chapel one day. He was talking in chapel, in the, the chapel, they call it, don't they uh, call it the V. Raymond, there's an Edmund Chapel now, yeah. Um, and he was speaking in chapel one day, and he was talking about coming into the presence of the Lord. V. Raymond Edmund was talking about, and he was using an illustration about how he visited the king of Ethiopia. And he told this story about how he stepped into the presence of the king of Ethiopia and how he came prepared and reverent into the presence of the king. And he said in the chapel service, when you come here to worship in chapel, you should be aware that you're stepping into the presence of the king. And of course, this is true wherever you are because God is omnipresent. But V. Raymond Edmund that day in chapel, preaching to those young people, talked about coming to the presence of the king. And within a couple of minutes in the pulpit, he collapsed and he went into the presence of the king and he finished his course. Now we do kind of hope we survive this sermon today, uh, but, it, but it would be good to be in the presence of the king. And one of the things that will help you when things are dark is to remember that he is everywhere present in his love and power. And you live in the presence of the king. So consciously step into the presence of the king. That's number four. Number five is give thanks. That's uh, giving thanks. You have thanks and praise. Thanks is for what he's done. Praise is for who he is. And number five is give thanks. I was driving up north. My heart was heavy. I had my boys, two of my boys with me, Dan and Wes. We're driving up to the UP, across the bridge and up north. I'm sorry, we weren't going across the bridge because we're coming from the Chicago area. So we're going up to the north woods in Wisconsin and we're going up north. And, and my heart was heavy on the trip up because there were things on my mind. And I thought, this is sad because here we are way up north in the UP and it should be a time that we're rejoicing together. And I realized that I would have to kind of um, somehow find a way you know, to rejoice. So I remember as I was turning left, uh, going west on Route 2 there, as you get up into the UP, I thought things, something has to change. So I pulled the van that we were driving over the side of the road with my boys. And I said, from now until we get to the conference center that we're going to, let's just talk about things we're thankful for. Let's just say things we're thankful for. And at first, you know, they just wouldn't come because my heart was heavy. But then we started to say, well, I'm thankful for this and I'm thankful for that. And then about all the way to the conference center, we were talking about all the kindnesses that God had given to us, all the things that God had done for us, all the reasons we had to be thankful. And by the time we got to the gates of the conference center, the Lord had lifted my spirit. It stayed that way the whole time that we were there. It was just an example of that. So we make a joyful noise. We serve with gladness. We sing. We enter his courts. Or we go to church. We gather with people. Or we're conscious of God's presence, even if we're not gathered with people. And we give thanks for what God has done. And we praise God for who he is. So it's very helpful to say, God, I thank you for what you've done. But it's also very helpful to say, I thank you for our, I praise you for who you are. I verbally acknowledge who you are and for what you've done. And then finally, number seven, we bless his name. We bless his name. And I would just say, get his name into play. You know, when you're going to go through McDonald's, you're going to pay for the person behind you because you're a Christian. You do things like that. And you just smile and you pay for the person behind you. And then one day you just say, tell him that was a gift because I'm a Jesus follower. That'll freak him out. Tell him that, you know, whatever. Uh, get the name of Jesus into play, into conversation. You bless his name. You speak highly of him. And you would say, now why would I do all of this? What would motivate me to do all these, these seven things? Making a joyful noise, serving with gladness, singing, entering his courts, going to church, or having a sense of the presence of the Lord, even if I'm walking in the woods, or giving thanks for what God has done, or, or giving praise for who God is, or blessing his name. Why would I do this? And then you go back to this psalm, and you see, because Yahweh God is the God over all the earth, in verse 1. 
Number one. Number two, seven reasons, of course. Seven reasons. Number two, because he's the creator of all things. Stop and think about that for a while. You know me, and you probably know that I delight in God's creation. You probably do too. People who have any sense do. Look at what God created. Look at what is created. Who did all of that? This Yahweh God of the Bible. This God whose son is our Savior, Jesus Christ, is the creator God. Jesus Christ himself is the creator God. It specifically says so repeatedly in the Bible. Whenever it talks about Christ, his power, authority, and deity, it talks about that he is an agent in creation. Creation was his idea. Everybody that you see is created by God. And so that's something to, that's a reason to give him praise. It's because he is the one true God, number one. And the, because number two, because he created everything that is. The writers of scripture, especially the Psalms, often wrote of creation. The awe-inspiring nature of the night sky, the wonder of the planets and their path across the sky, the mystery of the path of the sun across the sky. They wrote of the beauty of bodies of water, the power of the ocean, the majesty of mountains, the charm of a mountain stream, the music of a waterfall stirred up Godward thoughts in the poets of Scripture. Jesus pointed out the simple beauty of bird life and wildflowers and mustard seeds and foxes. And there's something to that, folks. You live in a really beautiful place on earth. I know it's winter time and it snowed and froze and you're not ready for that, but still, it was really a pretty snowfall now, wasn't it? And those trees are beautiful with their foliage and their leaves, but they're also starkly beautiful without leaves. Get used to them. You'll see them till May 15th. <laughs> Get used to them. It really, we live in a beautiful place. You don't have to drive very far around here to be immersed in creative beauty that God gave us. You should stop and thank God. That's a good reason to thank him. He created all that, this one true God. And then this is sweet. Number three, why would we praise him and thank him? Because we belong to him. We belong to him. There's a special way, sorry about this one, Lois, but there's a special way that I get to say, Lois is mine. He's mine. Yeah. That's, she's mine. That's because she belongs to me, kind of, sort of, you know, right? You know what I'm saying? You get it? Yep. You're getting quiet about it. Thank you, Eddie. Appreciate it. got one person w working with me on this, yeah. <laughs> Everybody else, they were just dressed up, were just looking at me like, <laughs> they're waiting for her to say whether she, did. you know, there's a sense in which, not in property ownership, you know what I was saying, in love. This is the way God is speaking. I belong to God. Well, now that's something to thank him for. I belong to God. I willingly, his servant, possession, child, son, I belong to God. How can I not give him thanks? We belong to him. That's in verse 3. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us. We are his. We are his people. <laughs> we are his people. As a people group and as an individual. That'd be a reason to thank him. Here's number four reason to thank him. Because he's our shepherd. And we're his sheep. How beautiful is that? And all the things that that implies and the artist implied and not listed out, what is a shepherd gives guidance to a sheep and a shepherd gives provision for a sheep and a shepherd gives protection to a sheep and he is a good shepherd and we are his sheep. And that'll make you happy when you pillow your head at night and know that you are a sheep of the good shepherd who will always care for you. Thanks be unto God. He is our shepherd and we are his sheep. And then this is another one in verse 5 and I remember this sweetly from my childhood. He's good. That's just what it says. He is good. God is good. Stephen Charnock, in his book on the, on the attributes of God, put a, wrote 150 pages of dense text with cross-references on the goodness of God. The Bible is full of the goodness of God. He is good. This is something that we should thank him for. Know that the Lord is God, verse 3, is he who made us, we are his, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Verse 5, this is in the why, for the Lord is good. And then you have this triad, this beautiful, 
thing is steadfast love or his mercy his, 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 endures forever. There's a special Hebrew word for this that scholars just work on. They can't exhaust its meaning. They write books about it. Michael Card has written as a popular singer and theologian, and he's written a book on this word. And it says, this word is it's so magnificent, a word for God's loving, merciful kindness that you can't even express it in our language. And this is the word that's being used here. Um, for the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever. His faithfulness to all generations. And so here are the seven, here are seven things to, to, to ways to thank him when our hearts are dark. We make a joyful noise. We serve with gladness. We sing. We enter his courts. We go to church. We recognize his presence. We give thanks for what he's done. We praise him for who he is. We bless his name. Here are the seven reasons to do it. Because Yahweh God is God of all the earth. Because he's the creator of all things. Because we belong to him. We're his people. Because he is our shepherd and we are his sheep. Because he is good. This is good, isn't it? And because his steadfast love and mercy endure forever. And finally, because his faithfulness endures to all generations. Someone said it this way, the whole world is a temple for his glory. And our lives are like a stage for his glory. That's what we, what we want to tell ourselves. When a dark cloud hangs over our spirit, or when we're filled with joy and we want to give expression to it, praise him and thank him and sing about who he is and talk about him in that way, about his goodness, his grace, his power, his creativity, his care, his provision, his guidance, his mercy. Now, stop and think. We're going to have pumpkin pie here. The smart people are going to have pumpkin pie this week. The smart people are going to eat pumpkin pie with black coffee. It's going to be black coffee. You got the cream, put that on your pie. That's where that belongs. <laughs> pumpkin pie with cream on it, and it or however you want to do it. It's Thanksgiving, so you go ahead and eat the way you want to. You're going to have, the, your wife is going to make, or your husband, whoever's doing the cooking over there, is going to make something really special, or you're, like, you're going to cook for yourself. But anyway, you, you're going to, I remember one time I was taking the offering, and I was praying for the offering, and uh, if you like rabbit trails, this is a rabbit trail. Um, I was praying for the offering, and I said, dear Lord, thank you for the men that went out and worked, and they, and they whatever, you know, then a lady that was a school teacher wrote me a little note and said, I almost didn't put my check in the offering when you prayed for all the men who worked, <laughs> and I've never made that mistake again in my life. So ladies, feel free to put a check in the offering. And, and, and so anyway, so what, 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 what do we have? Here's, here's my point. It's probably an important one. And that is, when we think about Thanksgiving, we think, oh, I'm grateful I got to play basketball this year. That's great. What a neat thing. Or I'm grateful that I have a faithful wife. How, how's, how, how wonderful is it to have a loyal, faithful wife? And she's going to put on the apron and she's going to make nice things for the family and all the kids are going to come over. They're going to be grandkids over at the house. How, how rich am I? that I would have a little place in the country that grandkids would come over and they were all going to thank God for all that he's given to us. But this psalm doesn't talk about that. This psalm doesn't talk about pumpkin pie or your football team. As cool as all that is, it doesn't talk about that. Isn't that interesting? I, I can say I have a faithful wife, but there are men that should be thankful that don't have a faithful wife. I can say I have pumpkin pie, but there are people on earth that aren't going to have pumpkin pie. They're not going to have much to eat or maybe they don't even have water. And yet, this is for all the people in all the earth for all time. How can a person be thankful if he lost his job? How can a person be thankful if he has a cancer diagnosis? How can a person be thankful if things are falling apart? How can a person be thankful if his heart is broken and it doesn't look like there's any way to fix the things that are broken in his life? That's what a psalm like this is for. It only implies those other things. It speaks directly to something that's much deeper. This should be seen and understood in light of the whole message of the Bible. You can't read Psalm 100 if you know the Bible without seeing Calvary in it, without seeing Jesus in it. His loving kindness and mercy and faithfulness, how can that endure to all generations? Because Jesus came, and because Jesus died, and because we're in him, then the things that are most important to us can never be taken away, even if we don't have some of those other things. And that's where we root our faith and our confidence and our joy and our thanksgiving. We root it in things that will never be taken away from us, because all of us, barring the rapture, are going to die someday, and it probably won't be fun or pretty. 
It can be embarrassing and difficult and sad and hard. And we have difficulty to look forward to. But yet when we say, I will make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth, I will serve the Lord with gladness. I will come into his presence with singing because I know the Lord, he is God. And it's he who made me and I'm his. I'm his people, the sheep of his pasture. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving. I will enter his courts with praise and give thanks to him and bless his name because he's good. And his steadfast love endures forever. And his faithfulness will never end because it endures to all generations. This is how. There was a pastor in Ohio and in his church he had a surgeon and a surgeon said to his pastor, Sunday you should come and you should watch what I do. You should, there's a gallery and there's a glass and you can sit in the gallery, you can watch me do, I'm going to do an open heart surgery. You can come and watch this open heart surgery. So this pastor in Ohio went to the hospital to watch his parishioner, who was his surgeon, perform an open heart surgery on a woman. They took her heart out and corrected, they fixed her heart. True story. And he said he watched, it was fascinating to watch this man do what he did and put the, fix the heart, did what he needed to do, put it back in place, he said. But then he said something really unusual happened that he didn't expect. He said when everything was done, everybody kind of stood back for a minute and they all just looked at her for a minute. And then the doctor got down on his knees next to her and he said something like he whispered something in her ear. After the surgery was over, he talked to the surgeon, the pastor said, what were you doing? What was that? He said, we performed open heart surgery, but that heart has to restart. And her heart didn't restart. And we didn't know what to do. He said, so I got down on my knees and I said to her, your heart is good. We fixed it. It will work now, but it has to start. So tell your heart to beat again. And when he said that, her heart started to beat again. Songwriter picked that up and I think Phillips, Craig and Dean and others have done it. Tell your heart to beat again. That's what Psalm 100 is telling us. Sometimes just your heart is so heavy and dark. But we have the means to tell our heart to beat again because of the worthiness of our God and his son, our Savior, Jesus, who did what he did for us. And so I think I'm among friends who agree with me. Am I among friends who agree with me about this? I will make a joyful noise. I don't know about you. I will serve the Lord with gladness. I will come into his presence with singing. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving. I will enter his courts with praise. I will give thanks and bless his name because I know the Lord is good. I know the Lord made me. I know that I'm his. I know him as people and his sheep. I know that he's my shepherd. I know that he's good and his steadfast love and faithfulness will endure to all generations. And this this is the spirit that we have here among the believers that gather here at Bethel, the glad spirit of people who humbly have thanked God for who he is. Imagine a glad and grateful person. Imagine a glad and grateful family. Imagine a glad and grateful dad, a glad and grateful lady, a glad and grateful church. Imagine how powerful it would be where glad and grateful people gather together and they're glad and grateful together. How powerful is it that a group could gather together not to be against something, but to be glad and grateful. Imagine how magnetic, imagine how compelling, imagine how attractive a person, a family, a church would be that are glad and grateful. Why don't we just agree to say it together? Why don't you repeat after me? I will make a joyful noise unto the Lord. I will make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Let's say it with a loud voice. I will serve the Lord with gladness. I will serve the Lord with gladness. I will come before his presence with singing. I will, come before his presence I will enter his gates with thanksgiving. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving. I will enter his courts with praise. I will enter his courts with praise. I will give him thanks and bless his name. Amen. Amen.